for the last little while, we've been taking a journey through the New Testament, looking at what it looks like to be a people who are hearing God's voice, being led by the Spirit, uh, being able to discern His will for us, figuring out, you know, is it the Lord speaking? Is it the pizza? Is it something that's a distraction? Um, you know, how do we actually navigate in terms of our own spiritual journey? And, and what does prophetic ministry look like knowing that we're in the New Covenant, New Testament believers, that we don't have to uh, be consigned to an old, outdated, obsolete Old Covenant model of prophetic ministry, that we actually need to shift away from that and actually shift into the new. And we were also looking a little bit in terms of how the early church in the book of Acts had encounters with the Spirit of God and how the Holy Spirit would break into the, the believing company of people and um, sometimes would actually just blow their minds. Yes. So for those who have this uh, innate desire to be in control, have some news for you. Especially when it comes to being part of God's people, um, Jesus gave us a little warning. He said, the wind will blow where it wills. So with the spirit of the living God. In other words, you're not necessarily going to be able to predict what's going on. One of the few places where everything is quiet, orderly, stays in its row, is the morgue. <laughs> but where there's life and where's the Spirit of God, there's going to be some spontaneity. There might even be some unexpected things. You know, we read the, the account of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and, you know, the, they were amazed. They were bewildered. They were perplexed. And we think, oh, that's such nice poetic language. No, 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 no. They were freaking out. They were freaking out because they had God in a box. Literally, the Ark of the Covenant, they had God in the box. You see, God does not want to remain in the box. He operates outside the box. You thought that was some kind of new business term. No. So, with what the Holy Spirit is doing in the early church, we can expect and anticipate that he would do similar things in the church now because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the kinds of things that he was doing as the church was getting established, well, what he started, he's going to continue. So we have this expectation that because God is alive, that he will do things. And when we come together, we have this expectation, anything can happen, and it probably will. Amen. We have this excitement as we gather together with God's people that we have an environment where He can do what He wants to do, and we're not so planning and controlling everything that there's no space or room for the Spirit of God. Okay. That was my disclaimer. So, Breakthrough Family, we are a kind of people who have positioned our hearts and our minds to be flexible. In fact, we found that there was, in one of the ancient texts, you'll see it in the subnote in Matthew chapter 5, it's the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be bent out of shape. And um, so we want to remain in a place where God can speak to us and he can reveal new things to us, that we're open to, to him um, blowing our minds, that we too would have this kind of, 
oh my goodness, I'm so amazed. Wasn't that amazing? Wow, were you there? Were you in the worship? Wasn't that amazing? That's what we're after, to be amazed by his presence. It's going beyond what, you know, we're rationally thinking and predicting. We're open to being amazed. Okay, five people. Okay, that's enough. Marvelous. So, we're in Acts chapter 8. We, we looked at a couple of different um, chapters previously. We, we looked at the outpouring of the Spirit when Cornelius, and it was the first time the Gentiles, in other words, the non-Jews, had encountered the outpouring of the Spirit. So we looked at that. And, um, and Peter got into a bit of trouble, got called back to head office, had to explain a few things. Yeah. Um, and anyway, here we are. We're, we're back in, in, in chapter 8. And the context that we noted was that there were a heavy persecution had broken out against the church. And this guy, Saul, he was going to later change his Facebook profile to Paul. Um, he, he was instrumental. He thought he was doing God a favor. How's this? He thought he was helping God by trying to crush the church. So Stephen got stoned and persecution breaks out. Lots of people getting arrested. The apostles stick around in Jerusalem, but the believers, they start moving, scattering into a whole bunch of different places. And so Philip, who's one of the deacons, and the deacons, they popped up in chapter 6. What happened was that the, the, the widows started fighting over food. And the apostles had an encounter with the wisdom of Solomon. And they said, let's delegate this to the deacons. And so the deacons, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, arranged things. Stephen was one of the the deacons, Philip was another deacon. And so Philip, because of the persecution and the church is scattered, he goes down to Samaria. Now we don't quite know exactly why he went to Samaria, you know, um, but he finds himself in Samaria and he starts doing what Jesus did. When Jesus was ministering, Jesus was just walking, doing stuff. He would preach the gospel. He would heal the sick and cast out demons. So Philip reckons this is a pretty good gig. Yeah? And, um, and so he goes down. And the, the interesting thing is that he's in Samaria. Why is this interesting? It's interesting for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Samaria is a place where the mixed race groupings lived. What do we mean by mixed race? Well, when Joshua led the people of God into the promised land, after they've been doing the loop for 40 years in the wilderness, they go into the promised land. As they're about to go in, God gives them an instruction, do not intermarry with the people from these cultures, from these tribes, from these nations, because they will lead you astray. They've got their own idols, they've got their own ways of doing things, and it's wicked. In fact, their wickedness has reached the peak where I actually need to come and judge them, and you're going to be my instrument of bringing judgment against them. I've given them a long enough time to turn, and they won't turn, so the land's yours because they have forfeit the land because of their wickedness and their evil. But because they are so wicked and evil, do not intermarry with them. That was the instruction. Because God wanted the people to worship only His way. But with some backsliding and all kinds of things, and probably there were a bunch of really pretty girls Sort of happens like that, doesn't it? So these guys, some of the sons, 
and some of the daughters, they intermarry. But the Hebrews say, you are no longer welcome here because they're jealous for the name of the Lord. So then there was an area, some area, called Samaria. And they said, you can go and stay in some other area, some area. So, but the Jews, because they'd kept themselves pure, they hated the Samaritans because they regarded them as lower because they had disobeyed God. Do you remember Jesus, he, he told a parable about the good Samaritan. What was so shocking about the parable? I mean, it was a poke in the eye to the Jews. It wasn't the parable of the good Jew. It was a poke in the eye because it was the people they hated. These people who hadn't held the covenant, they were traitors. They were sellouts. They were to be spat upon, scorned. And Jesus said, hang on, there's a good Samaritan. I mean, he is blowing the followers of God. He's blowing their minds. Who's my neighbor? This person you hate and despise is your neighbor. That was the point of the parable, yes? Okay. But it was because there was such animosity and hatred. Do you remember there was another time, um, James and John, they were known as the sons of thunder. That was their nickname. How do you think they got their nickname? Well, one of the times... Jesus was taking a shortcut and he went through Samaria. And there was some stuff that was going on, but the Samaritans didn't really receive. Who's this rabbi coming here? This is our turf. You get off over there. Like you trespass or whatever. And they didn't receive the gospel. So James and John, they're kind of like, not a problem, Jesus. We saw what Elijah did to the false prophets of Baal. And these they might as well be false prophets, these Samaritans. Just, you just give us the nod and we will do the Elijah thing and call down fire from heaven, sort them out. Sons of thunder. And Jesus said, whoa, boys. This is, you don't know what spirit you're of. Okay. My point is that the Samaritans were not loved. Hated, despised. Philip finds himself where? Samaria. Samaria. Why? Well, because Philip is one of the guys full of the Holy Spirit in verse so in chapter six. To be a deacon, they would choose men full of the Holy Spirit. So he's full of the Holy Spirit. And remember, Jesus before the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, 10 days before, it's going to be the ascension. He says, boys, stick around in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high, till the Spirit comes upon you, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, which is the area around Jerusalem, and then Samaria, and then well, you'll just keep going, ends of the earth. But these guys had stuck in Jerusalem, don't know exactly how many years, but it was a bunch of years, maybe seven, eight years. They'd had such a good time. I mean, the description from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, Acts chapter 4 from verse 32 yeah, 32 onwards, speaks about how there were no needy people among them, the apostles were doing great signs, there were miracles, there was breaking of bread, there was prayer, there was fellowship, they were having revival. Thousands of people were joining them, it was just the most amazing 
time of just being before the Lord. They would pray three times a day. They would have amazing meetings. They would be in each other's homes. You know, who's cooking tonight? Let's go and join you. Shared meals, all this kind of stuff. It was the most amazing community of the followers of Jesus. In fact, it was so good, nobody wanted to leave Jerusalem. So we noted a couple of things. We noted that actually, when there was chaos, when a situation arose because of the persecution, they stepped into the mandate and stepped into what they were supposed to do. So instead of interpreting, listen, the persecution and the chaos is causing the church to go backwards, actually it caused an acceleration in the church. And we, we kind of drew from that, that in times of crisis and difficulty, do not come to the conclusion, oh, the devil's winning. If our world gets shaken, as it did some three years ago, and there's some early seismic activity warning signals that that same shaking, you, you, you're tracking with me. There's some early warning signals that the same seismic activity of the same shakings are wanting to happen again. No matter what the shakings, no matter what happens with the economy or the stock markets or the government or any of these things, even if there's tremendous chaos, let's be looking to see the kingdom advancing in and through that. Amen. Let's not have the mentality, oh, devil's winning, church is declining, you know, oh, this is bad news. No, no, when there's shaking, when there's difficulty, God, what the enemy meant for harm, the Lord turns around, causes it to become good. So even though there's difficulty, but we're looking, Lord, what are you doing in the shaking? Listen, if you owned a beautiful home in Jerusalem, and you just refurbish the kitchen. And then this guy Saul comes knocking on doors. You're leaving that refurbished kitchen in a hurry. You're escaping for your life and you cannot take the kitchen sink with you. You've got to leave all that stuff. It's traumatic in their natural lives. And then for those believers, it was traumatic. They couldn't even stick around to sell the place. You're tracking with me. In their immense confusion and loss and upheaval and pain, the Lord still caused a tremendous advance for the kingdom to take place. Some of us have lost things. Things have happened. You can either get bitter or you can get better. Okay, Lord, I release that. Protect my heart. And cause me to step in the new because this, that shaking is going to cause something new to explode. And Philip was a deacon, he wasn't an apostle. So don't discount yourself, say, well, you know, I'm not an apostle, so. No, Philip wasn't either. We don't know if he was escaping all the estrogen in the house. You know, it says he had seven daughters. You know, if he just needed a bit of a break that he went to Samaria or what, we're not too sure. But for whatever reason, he finds himself in Samaria. Okay? And, um, and he's among this people group that previously he should have hated. But what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost? You'll be my witness. You'll be empowered 
in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria. What are the implications? You're going to be empowered. Your heart is going to change that you will go to places you previously did not want to go. Places you hated. He's going to change your heart. Come on. Um, there was a day. It was more than a day. There was a time. When I said, Lord, I'm yours. I'm available. But I had a list of places I was not prepared to go to. It's ridiculous, right? But I had one internally. It's like, never Joburg. It's like we were at the coast. We loved it. It was a lovely place, you know. It was the kind of place. The education system was great. It was wonderful for raising kids. I mean, our history was there. We loved the place. It was just like, oh, a little bit of heaven on earth, you know. That's what we thought at the time. It's kind of like, Joburg, you've got a Sodom, Gomorrah, Joburg. No, we're not going... <laughs> We're not that. <laughs> but what did the Lord do? Because it was like Samaria for us. It's like, I'm not going there. Those people are crazy. Have you seen the way they drive? <laughs> yeah. Now, if somebody's not going at the speed limit, it's like, what's your problem, Buster? Get out of my way. Whereas before, we were like so intimidated to drive like 40 k's an hour. Like, think we were really doing it. Okay. The Lord changed my heart. The Holy Spirit will empower you. He says, well, look, you know what? I'm a shy person. You know, it's not really my nature. It's not my character to tell my work colleagues or my neighbor about Jesus. You know, so I'll just, I'll just shine my light in my own kind of way. Because, so, you know, I just, I'm, just, I'm an introvert. He, God made me this way. You know, I just don't raise my hands in worship because I just, he didn't make me that way. Okay. When the Spirit comes upon you, he will cause you, he will enable you, he will empower you to do things you otherwise wouldn't have done yourself. There was another guy by the name of Saul. King Saul. And what happened was, that he was, he was not from the right tribe. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And he hangs around a bunch of prophets. There's a company of prophets. Not like as in a business company. Just there was a gathering of prophets. And he gets among them. All of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul. And he starts prophesying. And the people kind of like, what? What's going on here? Like he's not supposed to prophesy. He's not one of the prophets. Like what? And the scripture says, because the spirit came upon him, he was changed into another man. You remember that? Yeah. When the spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, you are changed to become a new person, if you like. Because the power of the Holy Spirit is so powerfully working in you, going beyond your natural personality. Causes you to cross over into places you otherwise wouldn't have crossed over. It's like, I don't want to draw attention to myself, so I'll just, I'll just praise the Lord in my own way. This, this is my joyful look. I'm very happy. It's like, this is, my, this is my, I'm fully exuberant. This is me giving thanks. It's like, no, 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 when the Spirit comes upon you, the Spirit enables you to move out of what you previously limited yourself to think you were so that you can tap into who the Spirit of God says you are. Amen. 
Where the spirit of the Lord is, there, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Yeah, I'm very free. I'm stirring a bit near. Okay, good. So Philip finds himself in Samaria because he's a man full of the Spirit. He's now in a place previously he would have hated. Previously he would have thought, I'm not qualified to go there. I mean, I'm just a deacon. I just do tables and food and sort out squabbles between old ladies. Which is, I mean, it's an immense task. You can understand why the apostles handed that off. And when he's there, he just starts out doing what Jesus did. And, well, let's read it. I want to make this a legal church service. Join us. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Acts 8 and verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Come on, yeah? And, and that's where we sort of were camping last week. Let's, let's read on. Now, for some time... A man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. And they followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and the miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw this, when he saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. So repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And after that, further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus. Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So much in this passage. I'm going to take some time to unpack it this morning. And we'll come back one more time for chapter 8 next week. Is that all right? Let's see how far we can get. Um, all right, which thread are we going to pull on first? So who's going down here of the apostles? Who went from Jerusalem down to some area? 
Okay, this is, not a, this is not a trick question. Open book test. Open your book. Have a look. Okay, Peter and John. Peter and? Who was the guy who said, call down fire on the Samaritans? Ding, ding, ding. Oh, my goodness. Isn't this amazing? The guy who wanted to obliterate the Samaritans is now praying for a different kind of fire to come. What a turnaround. Oh, my goodness. You know, I didn't used to love Johannesburg. And now, I'm not leaving. Love this place. Love this city. Love what God's doing. The, the destiny, the, the, the prophetic words that were spoken over the city. Lisa and I were with somebody yesterday. And um, they, they used to live two hours away from Johannesburg. And years and years ago, they were traveling and they were in another part of the world. And a prophet guy goes up to them and says, so, um, you know, you're traveling, all the stuff, this is really good. But I see the Lord. Um, what's that city there in South Africa with the airport? Johannesburg. I see the Lord moving you to Johannesburg. And they're kind of like, yeah, no, no, we're two hours away. You know, we could. He says, no, no, you don't understand. The Lord says, Johannesburg. They're kind of like, what? Joe? No. was on their list too. We just went to a housewarming for them, for their new house in. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. And they know that they're here. They could have retired anywhere. But the Lord said, here. Yeah. Why? Because there's, there's purpose, there's kingdom destiny tied up with the city. Amen. That's why I'm here. Amen. All right. So, John gets this immense change of heart to go and bring something absolutely precious to these people. Just a few years ago, he wanted to nuke. Yeah? Wow, I wonder with the change in some of the political alignments, if the Lord is going to put something in our hearts for people that previously we wanted to nuke. I wonder. Wouldn't that be interesting? Yeah? The Lord's got amazing ways of opening doors for the power of the gospel. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, how is this? Peter, not Peter, Philip. Philip, he's, he's doing what Jesus did and he leads the people in water baptism. And they are seeing some of the most amazing things that people are astonished, they're amazed, they're paying close attention because the power of God is being released. This is good. This is a key for the city. The city, it said, they, there was great joy in that city because the power of God had been revealed through an ordinary person, Philip. This gives us great hope. The Lord can use us as ordinary people in this city to bring great joy. That's why we prophetically have already called it Joyburg. Because we're prophesying God's going to do powerful things in the city. He's going to bring great joy to Johannesburg. Amen. Yeah? So we're looking to see what he's doing. We're positioning our hearts and our minds that the Lord would use little old me to do stuff. Yeah? You see somebody limping? You're kind of like, that's amazing. They've got a target on them. The target is they've got a need and we know the one who meets needs. So we're just doing this link bit. Hey, I know somebody who can fix this. How about it? Yay? I mean, the healing isn't in you. The healing's in him. It's not your great power. You see, this is where 
Simon was getting it wrong. He kind of like, hey, I need this power. His heart wasn't properly connected. A few other issues, if I've got time, I'll try and get there. But he was observing the power that was taking place, thinking that, oh my goodness, the apostles have got magic in their hands. Like it must be in their hands because if they lay hands on, things happen. Okay, so we learn from this not to make that same mistake. Oh, there must be only certain people who've got God power to do stuff. And, oh, I just don't have healing hands. It's like, no, 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 wrong conclusion. He is the healer. And so we're connecting people to the healer. It's like, no, no, don't look at us. Look to him. He's the one. So we, we're living with this anticipation that there's going to be signs and wonders. We're going to be amazed because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the healer. Not he was the healer. He is the healer. So he's constantly in healing mode. Yay. All right. We, we live with an anticipation that God is going to change our hearts and cause us to do things, to be what people need for us to be for their situation to be resolved. So previously you were not somebody who enjoyed, liked, appreciated Samaritans. Guess what? He's going to change your heart. So that you'll be in the place where you're going to love Samaritans. Yeah? Now, you can either go because the Spirit has come, or you can wait for some shaking. Are you understanding the implications? But, but God's, God's got a plan. And, and he's going to execute his plan. And he would love for us to step into that. And sometimes we need things to just have some upheaval before we're willing to get up off our blessed assurance and actually do the things of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Simon is watching what Philip is doing. And he kind of like is amazed at the signs and the wonders. But he offers no money for that. The apostles come. And they're kind of like, okay, water baptism, tick. Healing, tick. Demons, tick. Heavenly language, anyone? No. Baptized in the Spirit? No. Oh, we know how to fix that. Let's go to the next level. And they lay hands on the people. And Simon says, I want that. Come on. Simon didn't say, name your price for the physical healing. What radical different upgrade did he recognize because of the empowering of the spirit of the living God that he said, I need that more than anything else. I'm provoked by this story. Because I'm provoked, I'm going to provoke you. It's like, my mind would have been like he amazed people with all his trickery in the past. So, hey, how much I want this power to heal people. Why? Well, there's an overlap of what was going on in Simon's heart 
with the fact that he, he was in Samaria. Come on. God said, here's the promised land, keep it pure. I don't want you intermarrying because you will go after their false gods, their idols. What was he doing? Simon was using demonic powers, false god, witchcraft, sorcery, instead of, because he's, he's half Jew. He's a Samaritan. So instead of walking in righteousness and in the power of God, he's now got a mixture in his life. Huge significance for us, especially in the context we find ourselves in. There are only two sources of life, well, sources of power. There is light and there is darkness. There is God and there is the devil. There is true and there is false. There is pure and there is a mixture. Simon was in Samaria and he was amazing people with a mixture. And he was using demonic powers to bamboozle the people. And the people who he was bamboozling were half Jews. Hello, 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 hello. You can either do it God's way, walk in light and in truth, or you not either. You can only. Because there was a reason that the Samaritans were kind of like, mm-mm. You can't come here because of this dabbling with idols. That's why God said, listen, don't intermarry because this is what's going to happen. And you know what? Became a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's what they did. So he's engaging in all of this false stuff. Sorcery. It's like, yeah, but it's my culture. Now I've got it from my mom's side of the family. <laughs> Come on, think about it. It's like, yeah, you know, in our family, in that, that side of the family, they do, they've got these little, you know, wooden things and, you know, we put down a bit of fruit and whatever, you know. 25th of December, we put a cookie and a glass of milk, you know. That's my mom's side of the family, we do that kind of thing. We have this crazy thing that a fat guy is going to come down the chimney and, um, and, you know, and it's going to, all this amazing prosperity and gifts and everything is like, we get it from my mom's side of the family. Sorry, I just thought I'd throw that in there before you self-righteous. It's my culture, you know. Circumcision. My culture, we go to the bush. It's my culture, you know, we've got to slaughter the goat. Are you trying to mix something here? Get a little quiet. So Simon, he's one of the reasons I'm going to interrupt myself. This is the interruption coming. 
One of the reasons why I took so much time at the beginning of the year to talk through about discernment and checking to see, is this God? Is this the voice of the Spirit? Or is this just another WhatsApp thing that's coming through the Samaritan group? Are you tracking with me? It's like, is this really God? Or is this just a mixture that's going on? All right? Because we've got, we got heaps of places in this country and on this continent that say they're Christian and are prophesying till the cows come home. Literally, they want the cows. It's not prophet, it's prophet. And they're abusing people with so-called stuff, but it's a mixture. And in fact, many of these people, you say, like, okay, so who trained you? What's your spiritual heritage? What are your roots? Where did you grow up? Who in the Lord actually mentored you and discipled you? It's kind of like they were a nobody sitting in a tiny little classroom in a school that you've hardly even heard of. They paid their dollars and they went to the mountains and the caves in Ghana and they came back and now they've got a church of thousands. Something's not right. Something's not right. They literally sold their soul to the devil. Something that absolutely intrigues me. I haven't figured this out because the demonic still allows them to so-called preach in Jesus' name. So I, that I've not figured out. But there's a mixture. This is, this is Simon the sorcerer territory. And the Samaritans and some of the Christians haven't figured out that we need to walk in the light. When you hear his voice, we need to test. Hold on to the good, throw away the bad. Figure out, is this really in the spirit, is this really accurate? Because a lot of people are amazed. So amazed they're willing to come and stand in line at a speed point and pay their 2,000 or 3,000 or 7,000 so that the man of God can pray a special prayer for them. And it's a Samaria kind of a mixture going on. And it's so called in the name of Christianity, but it's not. Now, why, why are we going after these? Some of these things that when, we, when we're preaching and we, we're speaking like this, we're speaking into the principalities and powers. Some of it is because some of us are new to the faith and we didn't know it was wrong. And until somebody explains it, you're going to think it's okay. It's like if you grew up in Samaria, you probably thought that was okay. But it's only when the apostles come down, they say, no, 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 that, that won't work. There's destruction at the end of this road. So there's got to be a turning around. Pray for me that none of what you said will take place. Like because I want to come into the light. Does this make sense? I mean, God did not. Hey, you just got to weep at the mercy of God. Because <laughs> he says to the boys. Before Pentecost, he says, when the Spirit comes, I'm telling you, I'm going to do such a work in you that you're going to go to these people that have got it half right, half wrong, got it completely back to front, and they're combining false gods and all that. The very thing I warned them about, told them not to do, and they still went and did it. It's like, should just give them a big shambok and go to hell. Come on would be a lot of human attitude and God says when the spirit comes on you I'm going to do such a work in you because I love those people like but God they so messed up he says no I'm going to put my spirit in you so that you are going to go there I mean he specifically mentioned Samaria he didn't say Macedonia he didn't say Rome. I mean, there's the beast of Rome right there. He didn't say, no. He said Samaria. The guys who'd messed up. That's the mercy of God. 
You know, some of us, we've messed up, eh? Some of us, we got a mixture. We did all sorts of things and we're not proud of it. All the rest of it. It's like, is there any way home? Well, God says, hey, my, there's a target over you. And there's a target for my mercy. And there's a target for my grace. A target for my love. I'm coming to rescue and redeem you. Bring you into the family. You see... Their identity was they were Samaritans. They identified themselves by their mistakes or their parents' mistakes. And God reaches in and he changes them and he gives them a new identity. And now their identity is, I'm a believer. The mercy of God. He changes their identity. Those who were outcasts. I mean the sons of thunder want to do the Elijah thing. Call down fire. And he says no. They're a target for a different kind of fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We're going to send this I'm going to send an ordinary guy called Philip. And he's, he's just going to do, because he doesn't know any better. It's like, okay, what did Jesus do? What would Jesus do? It's like Jesus would tell them that there's good news. And then he would pray for people. And if a demon showed up, he'd just like tell it to get lost. So let me try that. And it's like, boom, boom. It's like ordinary people just doing ordinary Jesus stuff. And a whole thing shifts and changes. And now, Samaria is not a barrier anymore. Now we can do the ends of the earth. Chapter 13 is just around the corner from chapter 8. Isn't that extraordinary? I don't know if you get moved like I do, but wow. Anyway, there were a whole lot of other things I said in the first service which I didn't get to hear. How did I manage to do more in the first service, which is half the amount of time? Like, I was. Yeah. All right. We'll 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 see what we can do next week. Can we maybe just pray? That'd be a good way to end the service. So Holy Spirit, would you work in my heart? Where there the places should we sit this time to pray? Okay. All right, then I will too. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would touch our hearts and our lives, that you would so come and fill us, that it would result in a change, a shift, a transformation internally, cause us to, to love the things that you love, things that previously we didn't love. But because you're doing a work by the power of the Spirit, you're transforming our hearts and our minds. You lead us, you guide us, you cause us to be in the right place at the right time. And you give us a heart for situations and people previously we didn't know, didn't know that we had. So bring about your change. We're asking, Lord, that as we face uncomfortable situations 
that our heart response would be, Lord, what are you doing? What is the new thing you're opening up for us? That we would remain in a place of trust, of hope, of peace, of confidence that your kingdom is growing. Help us to be a people available to you. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Where we've been involved in things where there's a mixture, where we thought, ah, oh, it's okay. It's just, you know, part of what the family does. It's like Simon who had to walk away from those things. Help us to walk away from those things too. Simon, he believed. Simon was water baptized. But he still had to leave things turn his back on them and not dabble in a mixture. Help us, Lord, to not dabble in a mixture. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. The overwhelming testimony of your love and your mercy for those of us who've messed up we've fiddled with things we shouldn't have fiddled with we've drawn things into our lives and into our families and yet you don't kick us out but you send you send ministry to us to bring about freedom. Thank you. Thank you for your enormous grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, as we, as we choose to walk in your ways, give us the strength and courage to step into new patterns new ways of thinking, new ways of living. We come out of the mentality of Samaria. We come out of that identity and we step into the new identity. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your kindness, your your tenderness. We're so grateful, Lord. Yeah. And as we go about our, our days, we come across people who are unwell, sick, physically impaired in some way, or just under the oppression of the enemy that we can bring light and light overcomes darkness. Thank you for healing, deliverance, freedom that flows in the city this week because you're working in and through your people. Thank you that you are turning this city into a place of great joy. We're grateful. Yeah. So as we go from here, let your light illuminate our path, shine in our hearts, as we take time just to draw aside this week to pray, to fast, seek your face, Lord, move in us, and then move in this city, move in this nation. Thank you for your peace, your love, your protection, and your provision. We ask all these things in the name that is above every other name, Jesus. 
Amen.